Okay, clear. Let's get the hell off this. Yeah. It was a scene that seemed too horrific to be real. Yeah. Blood on the wall. The victim, 35-year-old Kelly Clayton, a beautiful wife and loving mother of two small children. Help me, help me, my wife. She's dead. Hurry. Kelly's husband, Thomas, called 911 after returning home from a poker game, finding her body on the kitchen outside his home. Police tried to calm him. How you doing? Just take some deep breaths, okay? I know, yeah. Just take some deep breaths and stuff. Just try to stay calm. What's up, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Blood on the Razor Wire TV, where we bring it to you real and we bring it to you raw. I think we're going to start doing a true crime Friday, right? One scary night. With all the things that are going on with, like, the Brian Kohlberger, the guy in Massachusetts who just was arrested for killing his wife, I think we can do some good documentaries on these on Friday nights, and I hope everybody will tune in. Tonight, we're going to highlight a heartbreaking story, a story that's shocking, a story that by the end of the video might hit you in the heart, might make you feel sad, might make you feel remorse for the people that were involved, which includes two little children. This is a case where you wonder why all these people that think they're so smart, why they're just so damn stupid, right? Why do they do the things that they do? Do they not realize that 99% of the people that do these things get busted and go to prison for the rest of their lives? Do they not realize that? But in this case, we're going into Elmira, New York, not far from where I'm from. I remember seeing this while I was in prison, I believe on Good Morning America and saying, damn. And I was like, he did that. Just kind of had that feeling like, dude did that. So now we're going to highlight that story. Someone else is highlighting it tonight too, 2020. But their stuff will be on after arms. The story is about a man named Thomas Clayton. Hockey player, good looking guy, beautiful wife, family, kids. And then one night, one scary night, his wife ends up dead. Will he be convicted? Or will he walk away free? Is he the guy that did it? Or was it someone else? You'll find out by the end of the video. Shortly after midnight on Tuesday, September 29, 2015, Thomas Clayton, the star hockey player, returned to his home from a poker game to find his wife dead on the kitchen floor. He joined the Jackals as a forward late in their second season right out of Niagara University, where he played hockey for four seasons from 1998 to 2002. After retiring from hockey, Clayton owned a business franchise, Paul Davis Emergency Services of the Southern Tier, a fire and water damage restoration firm. He would later become project manager at ServPro, a similar franchise, owned locally by his longtime friend and fellow Binghamton native, Brian Lang. Kelly Stage, that was her name, before she had married who some call a real-life jackal. Kelly Stage Clayton, 35, was a 1998 graduate of Elmira Free Academy where she was an honor roll student, participated on the cheerleading squad and softball team. She met Thomas Clayton while he was a professional hockey player in the early 2000s. They later married and had two children, daughter Charlie and son Coleman. Life looked good for the young, attractive couple, but it was not long before Thomas Clayton decided he did not like the married life. Being a father and a husband, to him, was not what he had thought it was all cracked up to be. He wanted his freedom back. He liked being a playboy, some would say. He thought he had the perfect plan, kind of like Brian Walsh, who was arrested this week in the murder death of his wife Ann Walsh in Quincy, Massachusetts. Or Brian Kohlberger, a man who was too dumb for his own good. But in the end, their perfect plans always turn out to not be so perfect after all. Earlier that night, he had drove one of his company trucks to the poker game. His personal truck was not in his possession, because he and one of his employees had temporarily exchanged trucks earlier that day to facilitate the unloading of an all-terrain vehicle, an ATV, the employee had borrowed from the defendant over the weekend. Surveillance footage showed the defendant's personal truck leaving the parking lot around noon, presumably driven by the employee. The employee's maroon truck left the lot at 3.09 p.m. with the ATV in the back. When the maroon truck returned at 6.04 p.m., the ATV was no longer in the back, presumably having been unloaded by the defendant. A few minutes later, a company truck and the maroon truck left the lot. Clayton arrived at his poker game in the company truck around 8 o'clock p.m. During the poker game, he used his cell phone to look at social media. Sometime after 10 o'clock p.m., 
He asked his host's wife if he could use her cell phone to call a worker, claiming that he had left his cell phone in his truck. He took the borrowed phone into an adjacent hallway, placed a call to his employee, engaged him in a hushed conversation, and then deleted the call from the phone before returning it to its owner. But who was his employee? Did he have anything to do with the murder of Kelly? Michael Beard was a laborer who lived in Elmira Heights. He worked for Clayton at Paul Davis and also worked for a time at ServPro. Beard also rented an apartment in the village of Elmira Heights that was owned by Thomas Clayton. Beard was familiar with the layout of Clayton's home in rural southeastern Steven County, as Clayton often had him over to do odd jobs around his property. Kelly Clayton was killed sometime before midnight, September 28, 2015, in her home at 2181 Ginnon Road in the town of Catton, the place where she was supposed to feel safe. Thomas Clayton, who had been at a weekly poker game with friends according during the evening, cold-heartedly called 911 to report the murder shortly after returning home around 12.30 a.m. September 29th. Suspicion would quickly fall on Thomas Clayton. There was no forced entry into the house, and investigators immediately suspected Thomas Clayton of taking the lives of his children's mother. Investigators would take him to the police station for questioning around 4.30 a.m. Before the patrol car had left the driveway, he had told investigators, Well, you'll know where I am because my vehicle has GPS on it. He was already trying to lay his foundation that he had no involvement in the death of his wife. By the end of the day, the Steuben County Sheriff's Office, not falling for his nonsense, charged him with second-degree murder. But it would be difficult proving he was involved. Within days, investigators had reason to believe a more complex plot was involved, that Clayton had hatched a murder-for-hire scheme involving his employee Beard, and that Beard had actually carried out the crime. Beard was eventually arrested, and wanting out of any jail time, he wanted to cooperate with law enforcement. But would they let him leave, knowing that he was the killer? Beard initially told investigators Clayton offered to pay him $10,000 to kill Kelly and to burn down his house for insurance money. He repeated the same story to a grand jury at the time that he thought he had a deal with prosecutors. Instead of helping himself, Beard was sealing his own fate, and soon he would find that out. As a result, both men were charged with first-degree murder. Realizing that his statements and testimony only made things worse for himself, he later recanted his confession and said Clayton only wanted him to burn down the house and that nobody would be home. He claimed Kelly was already dead when he got there and that he panicked and ran, but no one was buying his new story. The prosecutor's office decided they were taking Beard to trial, and that they did. Beard went to trial in November 2016 and was found guilty of first and second degree murder. Then Stuben County Judge Peter Bradstreet would sentence him to life in prison without parole. The case against Thomas Clayton was more difficult. In fact, he was able to get out of jail while the case was pending. No physical evidence pointed to Clayton. It was all directed at Beard. Since Beard recanted his confession and changed his story at his own trial, prosecutors couldn't call him to testify against Clayton. Once again, Beard had caused his own demise. It would be life for him in New York State Prison. But could the prosecutors convict Clayton? With no real evidence, how could they? Or was there other witnesses to the crime? Did Beard act alone? Or did he have help? Little by little, the prosecutors put together a circumstantial case. But they knew that it would not be easy. Beard had help. How did it all unfold? Before law and police knew that another man, Mark Blanford, had been the lookout for Beard, who now claims he was not involved. The trial started with everyone, everyone wondering what they would learn. Was Thomas Clayton the former hockey star? As cold-hearted as the prosecution was saying? Or was he a grieving father and husband? The circumstantial evidence said that he was a nasty, nasty man with a cold heart. The case went from just circumstantial to a little more convincing. Blanford was a friend of Michael Beard. Beard had picked his good friend Mark up that night in a maroon truck. They would drive to the outskirts of Corning before pulling the truck to the side of the road. Mark would stay inside the truck as a lookout, while Beard took an object from the bed of the truck and walked off into the dark night. Approximately 15 minutes later, Beard would return breathless, sweating, and carrying a stick. On the way back to Elmira, he stopped the truck and threw the stick off to the side of the road. 
They drove a bit farther, and when they came to a bridge near water, he slowed the truck so the lookout could throw a bag of clothes into the water. Surveillance footage showed a truck returning to the company's parking lot at 12.55 a.m. A few minutes later, someone rode away on a bicycle. Thomas Clayton had previously bought a bike for his employee, Mr. Beard. The evidence was coming together. Investigators were putting each piece of evidence together, little by little. A few weeks after the murder, investigators recovered a bag from a swampy area located approximately 40 feet from the inn in Elmira, New York, with respect to which Thomas Clayton had previously inquired about the presence of surveillance cameras. The bag contained clothes, and genetic testing determined that Beard's DNA was on the clothes. But in an interview later tonight, he will likely tell 2020 that he wasn't involved. Six days before the murder, someone from Clayton's company called the storage facility located next door and asked whether the company's property was within range of the storage facility surveillance cameras. In fact, the company's parking lot was within range of the cameras and surveillance footage from the night of the murder would be played for the jury at Clayton's trial. Three days before the murder, Clayton also called an acquaintance and asked him whether there were surveillance cameras outside a certain inn located in Elmira. The acquaintance was not aware of any cameras, but offered to check. Clayton declined that offer. The jury would hear that part as well. But would it be enough to convict? Several women testified at trial that they were having sex with Clayton while he and the victim were married. Clayton, according to the women, made dispersing remarks about Kelly to some of those women and told at least one of them that he couldn't divorce the victim because she would take everything. Approximately one year before the murder, Clayton would increase the limit on his wife's life insurance policy from $500,000 to $1 million. A few weeks after that, he had told his wife's niece, this is going to be the last Christmas with me around and us being together as a family. You might wonder how someone could be so stupid as to raise a life insurance policy and tell family members what he did all while planning the murder of his wife. Just raising the insurance policy would make everybody wonder. Mark Blanford, in exchange to have his second-degree murder charge drop, would testify at Thomas Clayton's trial. Blanford testified at Clayton's trial that Beard picked him up at his Elmira home the evening of September 28, 2015, and told him he needed a lookout while he broke into a home. In his original statement to police, Blanford said Beard told him someone was paying Beard 3000 to burn down his home for the insurance money and that Beard offered Blanford 500 to act as a lookout. Beard was already saying too much. Blanford said he didn't know Beard was going to kill anyone, but he did admit to helping Beard dispose of evidence after Beard returned from the Clayton residence. Blanford, for his assistance and testimony, was sentenced to three to six years in prison. At his sentencing, he said, I want to apologize to the family of Kelly Clayton for my role. If I could do it all over, I never would have gotten in that car. But his statement could never bring Kelly back. The prosecutor, Miss Wetmore, is satisfied with the sentence, noting that Blanford was remorseful, that he cooperated at every stage of the investigation and trial, but that he knowingly participated in a crime. Wetmore also pointed to the findings in a pre-sentence report issued by the Steuben County Probation Department. He does have Kelly Clayton's death on his hands, Wetmore would say. He has a criminal history of 30 years, and the overriding thing has been alcohol and drug abuse. He's had every opportunity to change his life and address those problems. And Blanford's attorney, Christopher Tunney, was also satisfied with the sentence. He's remorseful and he was cooperative, Tunney said, and he's going to pay a price for his role. However, despite all of that, his sorrow and everybody being satisfied, Kelly's family was not satisfied that they lost a daughter that they lost a sister, a cousin. But the most shocking thing in this case is the video camera footage from a body cam that captured Thomas Clayton's daughter, Charlie, say, a guy came and hit my mommy with a pipe thing. I thought she was dead when she was lying on the ground. The then seven-year-old also added that she thought the man hitting her mother was her dad because his eyes were similar to Clayton's eyes. In a letter to the court, that little girl would write, I feel like dad is a coward because he asked Michael Beard to kill my mom. After a seven week trial, what would the jury say with their final word? They would come back with a guilty verdict 
and Clayton will be sentenced to life in prison. The daughter's testimony was one of the key pieces of evidence offered by the prosecution, securing Clayton's conviction. Today, Clayton sits in the infamous Sing Sing prison, where he can sit in his cell, singing the blues for destroying the lives of not only himself and his wife, but also his children by taking their mommy away. Heartbreaking story, right? When you hear the words of that little girl, she has to grow up without her mother. Now she has to grow up without her father. You know, let this be a teachable moment. A moment where if you're thinking about doing some wild stuff, man, think about the other people that suffer. Think about your children. Think about the consequences. And it doesn't just go with cases like this. It also goes with what? When you're out there getting money, when you're out there doing the wrong thing, you could be leaving these little kids behind that love you, that look up to you every day. There's my dad. Or there's my mom. But anyway, what the hell was this guy thinking? Big old dummy. He had to be one of the biggest dummies ever, right? You get an insurance. Everyone knows. You know, when something like this happens, they go look at the insurance policy. You increase the insurance policy. You tell the family members, this is it. This is our last Christmas together. Like, you got to be the goofiest dude ever. And then how about Beard, right? Let's look at these people, man. Mr. Beard. Should have named him Mr. Big Old Dummy. He goes and picks up his homeboy. I need you to be a lookout. He's laying it down. He's telling them what's going on. Then when they all get busted, he tells the prosecutors, yeah, man, dude was going to pay me. He's down there talking like they're going to work out a deal. They're telling him, no, you're about to get life. So you want to help yourself out? And whatever they offer, maybe 20 years or whatever. And he's like, damn, man, I can't really do 20. So now he recants his testimony. Now, I mean, he didn't go to the grand jury without a deal, right? He, he thought he was getting something. And then he started scratching his head like, damn, I can't do that much time. I'm 40 years old. I get out. I'll be 70. Hell no. Changes his mind at the last moment, right? Changes his mind and he ends up with life. But he did that to himself. He did all that to himself. He recants his testimony, so now he can't go back and say, look, man, I'm sorry, man, please take me back. The prosecutor's like, no, nah, man, we can't because the defense attorney's going to cross-examine you. And, you know, one of his defense attorneys, I think he's a pallet attorney, is from an office here in Rochester who is a partner with one of my first lawyers in my case. I mean, they got phenomenal attorneys, but sometimes you can have the best attorneys in the world. And at the end of the day, they're going to slam that door shut. You're going to go to Sing Sing. You'll be sitting in a cell all alone, wondering like, damn, why did I do that? You lost everything that mattered, bro. Everything that mattered in your life. Most of all, your children. Blood on the Razor Wire TV. If you guys want us to do this every Friday night, let me know. We'll start making it happen. Hope you enjoyed it. With respect, Blood on the Razor Wire TV. Until tomorrow, we're out.